All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Introduction to Data Science. Uh, this will be the uh, video lecture specifically uh, told by me, Chris, as you can see here. Okay, so before we get into anything else, let us first try to answer the question, what is data science? I have this neat quote over here. It says, data science is a concept to unify statistics, data analysis, and their related methods in order to understand and analyze actual phenomena with data. So as we can see here, one of the more important things is actually to get additional insight into our data. That is what we do with data science. That is what this course is designed for, is to give you this additional insight. So what makes a data scientist? Now the term data scientist has become a bit overpopularized in the sense that um, it's being applied very broadly while there's no real strong definition of the skill set that you would require uh, being a data scientist. And what I specifically mean with this is that there's a lot that's required of you being a data scientist, not only knowing algorithms or being able to program, but also being able to uh, deal with very large data sources, as it says here, manage large amounts, creating visualizations uh, that aid into understanding data, build mathematical models, uh, present and communicate the data uh, insights slash findings. So there's a lot of things that are required from you on top of just being able to understand the material that we cover in this course. Now, one of the additional problems is that there is a lot of related fields that I think sort of link to what people think of when they ask for a data scientist. We have artificial intelligence, which is uh, different from sort of the other fields here in the sense that artificial intelligence really focuses on intelligent behavior. So we try to copy human behavior, something that we deem intelligent. And this is sort of how it's defined that you're doing artificial intelligence research is mimicking these kind of behaviors and perfecting them. Now, machine learning, on the other hand, really mostly ties in with uh, with AI in a lot of publications that you might see in the news. Um, but machine learning really only focuses on certain learning objectives that we want to achieve using uh, programming, different uh, functions, different algorithms, sort of things that we might deem are clever, but can be pretty stupid under the hood. And what you will see is that for most of machine learning, people are interested in doing more than just mimicking humans. We're mostly interested in doing better than humans. We want to be able to, for example, classify a lot of information uh, very quickly, which is unthinkable as a human. Now, data mining is also sort of a, an overarching concept, but it very much boils down to dealing with data, pre-processing, analyzing, getting insights, applying algorithms that are actually borrowed from machine learning. Um, and it will also require you to visualize these kind of things. Um, and it's therefore one of the more vague terms, I think, in this entire table. Now, I'm not going to cover all of these. I'm just going to very quickly go through them. Uh, information retrieval is basically what you do when you type something in Google. You have a query and you want to retrieve information that a uh, user is particularly interested in, which can be web pages, images, videos, whatever. Anytime that you do a search and you get something back, whether it's in your Google search, any other search engine that you use, maybe Siri or any other voice assistant, once you give a certain query and there's a certain retrieval of information, that is what information retrieval deals with. Now, natural language processing, as it says, deals with interpretation of language, uh, clever interpretation, maybe human-like interpretation, because um, it's hard to think of a better interpretation of language than, than humans do, obviously. But some of the systems that are developed can actually uh, capture information way better than we can explain as humans. Now, for computer vision, um, this focuses on the sort of vision system that we as humans have. So processing images, getting information from them, sort of dealing with the semantics of images, um, object classification within images, these kind of things. And then audio signal processing is also pretty self-explanatory in this regard, but it deals with audio. So with speech, with music, these kind of things. Now we have cognitive sciences. This is way too broad. I'm not going to get into this, but this dealing with the brain specifically, uh, processes that we have going on there and trying to make sense of those. There's a bunch of educations I've listed here that we uh, 
that we focus on specifically within our department, uh, they can be related to any type of data mining. So you can um, treat VR or sensory data as input. You can treat medical sort of brain scans, maybe um, medical documents as input. There's intelligent games where the agents that are within a certain game behave intelligently. This can be based on machine learning, for example. You might have seen the news regarding uh, DeepMind and Go. This is exactly what uh, the uh, sort of field of intelligent games deals with. And finally, we can even simulate certain um, agents, as we call them. Again, same as in games, basically, entities animals, insects, these kind of things. Can we make sense of their behavior? Can we model this? Which is obviously part of biology research or anything related. So any of these fields you might actually encounter while doing data mining, you might be, you know, you have some language data or text data that you'll have to deal with, maybe some audio data that you have to classify or maybe do some clustering on. This is all kind of fields that are very closely related and therefore it's important to understand the minor differences. But most importantly, they have one commonality, right? They, they deal with data, they're data-driven science for the most part. Now, I'm not one, I don't wanna say the same about cognitive sciences here, uh, also not about biology, but most of the things where, you, where machine learning or data mining is very closely related, you might say that they are a data-driven science. Now, because of this, it's it's very important for us to realize what actual, you know, what is data? What, what if, When we look at this picture of clouds, what is sort of the data that we see here? This is a, an actual phenomenon, real world phenomenon, as it said in the, in the definition of data science that we deal with real life phenomena. So what does the weather have that is data? Let's look at the very, very basic interpretation of the weather uh, through the eyes of a child, basically. We have this table here and there's a bunch of uh, attributes here. We can see that the, the kid sort of considers the outlook. So what does the weather look like? How is the temperature sort of, you know, it's hot, it's mild, it's cold. Is there a lot of wind going on? Yes or no. And finally, the sort of objective that this kid has is, can I play outside? Yes or no. Now this is the sort of data that we have. So in certain conditions, it might be sunny and hot, but not too windy. And the kid decides not to play outside. Another example might be it's cloudy, it's hot, it's not really windy. So the kid decides to play outside. Yeah. Now, in the end, we want to make a sort of inference as we call it. We want to make a classification or something, use this data to predict something. So given this, it's sunny, mild, so the temperature is mild and it's windy. Is the kid going to play? Yes or no? I'll give you a bit of time to think about it. Look at the, the table here and sort of see if you think that this kid is going to play outside given this, this condition. All right, so one of the first things that you might do is look at when it's sunny, is this kid generally playing outside? Yes or no? You can actually see that usually uh, this kid doesn't play outside when it's when it's sunny. Okay, so let's look at mild. We have a mild here and a mild here. Both of the cases, the kid really wants to play outside. So we can say, yeah, okay. So if it's mild, it's sunny. We can see some overlap here. Sunny, mild, play, yeah. So let's look at the last condition. Do we have a windy condition uh, where the kid wanted to play outside, where it was preferably sunny and mild. So as we can see, we only have this one, right? And uh, it wasn't windy. So we actually don't have a data point where it says, okay, the kid is going to play outside given these conditions. So now we actually have to do a prediction. We have to use this data that we have and then give a sort of outcome for play. Now, based on intuition, you would probably say, well, windy doesn't really matter that much, even though we might say that when it's windy, the kid is actually never really playing. From what we know of the weather, you know, if it's sunny, if it's mild, it doesn't probably doesn't really matter if it's windy, right? So you might say the kid is going to play outside. The most important thing here to realize, though, is that we don't have enough data to make a very 100% confident prediction. So let's look at this another way. And this is 
how to represent them as features. Um, if you look at this table over here, it has a lot of words. Those are not really things that a computer can process. We need to convert them somehow in a sort of numerical representation. So features can be these kind of things. So we can convert Outlook to a one, where, for example, one would be sunny, zero would be rainy, and maybe two would be cloudy. We can do the same for temperature, for windy, for play. You convert them into a number, basically, where there's a mapping. Um, I can sort of indicate it here. So one would be sunny, for example. Um, so one would be sunny, zero, maybe cloudy. And two, rainy. So this is sort of a numerical representation of the previously categorical data that we had. Um, we might also want to split it into a sort of a binary representation where we have one for yes and zero for no. And this converts into what you might know as dummy variables, where each sort of condition is split into its own feature or attribute. So we also call these things attributes. And we can say features are basically the same as attributes. There we go. Now in the next lecture, we will see how we convert these to feature vectors. Um, we are going to deal with vectors and their specific mathematical representation and how to do calculations with them. But again, this is for the next lecture, so let's go on. Now, one of the more formal measurements that we can do, obviously, is the actual weather. So rather than the sort of kid view that we had before, we can specify um, the degrees, the sort of temperature feeling, um, the uh, amount of rain, fall, speed of the wind, the UV index, and any probability of thunder, for example. Now notice that generally we will have this as a sort of representation, right? So this is something that we would generally see as data. So we will have sort of a row of data where it just says 22, 25, 13, etc. But also note that these units differ, right? So these are degrees, these are percentages, these are kilometers an hour. So from these, it's not really evident what sort of the scale is that they're on. So as we know, sort of the um, probabilities range obviously from one to zero to one hundred percent, while for example the wind speeds might range up to some kilometers an hour, let's say fifty. Now these differences really sort of complicate the interpretation of this. Even as a human, if you don't really know the units, it's, it becomes hard to make sense of all these numbers. Same holds for automatic methods to actually do this. Now we might also look at the weather as radar data where certain pixels represent a certain amount of rainfall. So red might be very much a lot of rainfall going on right here. And then these are just clouds with not too much rainfall. Actually, we might also combine this. I mean, it's an image, so we can probably interpret it. Um, combine it with other information that we have. And even, you know, not only focusing on uh, the weather, but we might also relate this data that we have to, for example, any ticket sales for some outdoor attraction, say a theme park. Okay, so hopefully now the um, sort of common trend of interpreting data has become sort of obvious. Uh, this is what we're going to focus on even more for this particular part. So let's get back to this child interpretation of the weather that we had. The most classic data mining algorithms really looked at sort of a rule-based system for predictions. So your challenge for this sort of table right here with our information is, can you come up with certain rules to predict uh, if it's playtime for this kid? So kind of think in your head, okay, if it's this, then that, and make a sort of a small list. Okay, there's several ways to go about doing this, but um, for now, let's first focus on when the kid actually wants to play and if there's any commonalities. 
Now, one of the things that we can already see, if, if it's sunny and it's hot, then the kid probably doesn't really want to play. These are the only conditions that we have, and we can see that in both cases, the kid doesn't actually want to play. So if it's sunny and mild, then the kid does want to play. If it's rainy and mild, it's the same thing. If it's cloudy and hot, then yeah, that's okay. So actually, we might say that if it's not windy, then the kid definitely wants to play, right? And then from here, we just really need to cover the edge cases. We can just say, if it's not windy, then yeah, maybe in another condition, no. So we can add another rule to this. We can say, well, if it's windy, then it's definitely no. So we cover these two, and then it's the only this first case that we really need to cover so if it's not windy, but it's hot and sunny, this is sort of the last edge case that we can uh, really use to uh, classify these three. So we have, if it's not windy, then um, the kid does want to play outside. So yes, play. So if it is windy, we can basically say um, no. So we need one extra rule here that if it's not windy, but it is sunny and hot, then it doesn't want to play, right? So unless sunny and hot. So all this time we've been looking at this sort of target, right? If the kid wanted to play, this is what we call a target. And we've been using certain points of information, which we call features to predict this target. Now I've specified a bunch of rules that sort of cover this um, as we've seen before. So if it's windy, we don't play. If it's hot and there's no wind, then we don't play. If it's not windy and not hot, we play. These are sort of different rules, different rule set, but they're probably a lot more specific than we might want to, right? Because if we actually go back to this first prediction that we wanted to do, by intuition, we would say that the kid would want to play, right? Now we've really, constructed these uh, rules that really capture the few conditions that we have, but any new data might fall out of the rules that we've uh, established here. Now this is quite an important slide because we will be using these kind of notations um, in future uh, examples. And it's good to know that when you see any formula that you know that these are sort of the standard notations that we use for everything. So write this down or keep this somewhere in a file where you can easily access it so that you can make sense of any other notations that you might come across in lectures. Now I'm just going to walk very quickly through them. You can just pause and, and read these all, but basically we refer to our data as X. Our data has features, as we saw, and these are sort of encoded within this X. Now, any random instance, so some instance within X is called a small X. If we want to specifically point at this one instance, then we can give its index number. So we can either range it from zero to whatever, or from one to whatever. Um, we can see the set of rules that we've established as a function. Uh, this function has a bunch of rules and it will use these rules to predict. Now functions we generally refer to as f. Um, we apply this function to a, a specific instance or some random instance x and this will give us a prediction for y hat as we write this. So this, this is the prediction that the function will sort of return or give. So it runs this one piece of data through f and it gives you yes or no, which is y hat. And this in summation we write as f of x. Now our hope is that the prediction, so y hat, is exactly the same as our target. And our target we generally refer to as y. So how is this different from y hat? Well, y is given, right? We know for play if it's yes or no. So we know the truth. Um, and y hat is a prediction of our model, so it's not necessarily correct. So here's a quick recap. You can just pause this and walk through it. Now, given the rules that we've established before, uh, we can actually convert it pretty quickly into code. So for those of you who will follow Python, this will make a lot of sense later on. For those of you who don't, Basically, it's it's almost English, right? So we have a function here, it takes data, so this would be f, 
and this would be a big X actually or a small X uh, given that we're only dealing with one instance um, so this would be f of x basically here's the rules that we've uh, established so the feature windy if that is no and the feature temperature does not equal hot so this is not equals this is equals so if the temperature is not hot then we return play so we will predict that the kid is going to play in any other circumstance we will return no play consider giving these rules this uh, one line that we had so it's sunny it's mild and it's windy should we play so it is windy so this first rule already doesn't apply right because we needed to both not be windy and the temperature not to be hot so we will return no play so is the prediction that we're giving that we're not going to play outside is realistic well probably if you are a kid and you see that it's sunny outside it's mild it's not too windy, you probably are going to play, right? But the problem is that we didn't actually see this as an observation and we've constructed these rules to really capture what we had as information without taking into account sort of generalizability. So how this rule might apply to new data. So in realistic cases, it's super important that we are able to evaluate how these kind of models that we make, these algorithms, whether they are rules or something different, that we sort of know how they perform and if they perform well on new data. So as you can see on this sheet, it's, it's very important that we evaluate these kind of models so that we know if our predictions are accurate and if we didn't really fit a model onto our data that exactly sort of captures that data but won't capture new data. And this last one also kind of recaps what we already discussed. So we didn't really take into account generalizability. So we made rules that specifically capture our data without really regarding that we might get new data where we don't actually know what the target value is. And we also want to sort of be able to evaluate how well it will do at predicting those. Okay, so let's try to evaluate the, the sort of rules that we made. So we decided on only using the last one. So if it's not windy and not hot, we play. And let's see how that sort of holds, um, given the data that we have. So for the first instance, it's not windy, um, but it is hot. So we would say in any other case, we don't play, right? So no. So this one we actually had correctly, right? Let's consider this one now. It is windy in this one. Um, so this whole thing doesn't imply anymore. So we say no, and we guess that one correctly as well. Now here it's not windy and it's not hot because it's mild. So we do play. So this one we got correct as well. And same here, it's not windy, but it is hot. So we would say no play. However, the kid decided to actually play outside here, right? So this one we have incorrect. Um, then for this one, um, it's not windy, it's not hot, we play, so it's correct. And for this one, it is windy, so we don't want to play. Here it says no play, so this one we also have correct. So five out of six. So let's look at the results. We got five out of six correct. And if we want to sort of represent it as a number, this would boil down to 83.3% correct. Now this measure in data mining is called accuracy, which will only look at how many percentages of the uh, actual target that we wanted to predict that we predict correctly. However, we do also have to consider uh, if we covered all the conditions correctly. What if we were presented with new data where there's a bunch of targets that we don't really know and we really have to predict them? We can say that the rules are probably too strict, right? We only have this one rule and in any other case, we will predict something different. So other than this training data that we had where we know the labels, we can determine these kind of rules that we want to sort of induce from this. Um, we also need test data. Now this test data will be unseen by us, which means that we will not look at it, we don't know the target, and it will also not be seen by the model that we're creating, right? Because generally it's not been seen by us, therefore the rules that we construct will also not be able to capture it. 
Um, we can use this test data to evaluate how our model will perform on new data. So very quickly, you can, you can sort of work this out yourself. But if we look at this, uh, we don't know the rules here. We will both, for both instances, we will actually predict an incorrect target because if you run it through this rule, you will see that one should actually be yes and two should actually be no. So in the end, it turns out that for our test set, so this unseen uh, data that we have, our accuracy is actually 0%. So the question now is, should we, given that we've seen this new data set, update our rules accordingly? And the answer might be uh, pretty counterintuitive because it's actually no. And why is it no? Well, we've currently, we've informed ourselves with this, this test set um, uh, regarding the performance uh, of our uh, classifier on unseen data, right? So we know that if we don't actually have these labels, then we will do pretty poorly. Um, but this is also, given that this is all of our data, only the only sample of unseen data that we actually have. So if we use this to construct new rules, we will not know how this performs on unseen data. So for this case, that might not seem too important. Why can't we just use these uh, new instances that we have? But consider this in a more practical case. So consider that we actually want to predict the weather. If we use all the data we have, so all of our observations, we never know if the weather that we're going to predict for tomorrow is actually going to be accurate, right? It might say that, okay, with 100%, we've, uh, we've predicted the weather sort of forecast for any given day, but that says nothing about how we will do uh, at predicting tomorrow. So for these kind of cases, you would want to leave some data unseen to the model so that you have an actual uh, measure of how it will perform. So it's very important to realize that for each case that we have, we have a bunch of data like this. So this would be all of our data. And we would actually want to split that in some portion, say this will be train and this will be test. Test. Now we will use this specific part to create our rules or our model or any other way that we can do predictions. And we would actually want to evaluate on this specific part. So this part, we will know the sort of targets. So the, uh, the labels for this. And for these, we don't. So we get a score for our train, which will probably be pretty high. So say 80%. And then for a test set, we will get another percentage, which might be, might be, for example, 50%. Now, what this sort of difference in performance really means, we will get into a bit later. But for now, it's good to realize that generally you would want to have a, a separate set of your data to actually uh, fit, as we call it, uh, your model on. So to kind of uh, strengthen the, the previous point that I made regarding uh, needing unseen data, we will uh, use a more realistic use case, which is the prediction of house prices. And I think this is a very nice uh, sort of classic data mining example because it really shows why we would want to uh, apply certain models to do predictions. Now consider the first bullet. So would you be able to determine the price of a house? So in general, you will probably not be house owners. Um, if you are, then that's lucky for you. You will probably know what kind of the factors are that determine the price of a house. However, if that's the case, you'll probably only know it for a few houses that you've seen while buying your house. Now, this is, of course, way different than people who actually sell houses for a living. They've seen way more houses and they have sort of this expert knowledge of what will sell in a house, what will drive up the price. It needs many observations to gain experience, to be really able to have this sort of mental representation of what would constitute a higher house price. Now, just from the top of your head, try to come up with a few features that will predict the uh, price of a house. You can do that now. So one of the things you will probably come up with is, uh, for example, the amount of bedrooms that there are, uh, if it has a big garden, if it's in a good neighborhood, these kind of things. So how would we evaluate house price? Previously, we had a very clear binary prediction where it's either yes or no. So we play or we don't play, it can be zero or one. 
This is why it's called binary. If we have more classes than just yes or no, um, and their order did not really matter, so for example, we wanted to uh, predict the outlook given that it's windy and the kid doesn't play these kind of things, we have more than uh, two, right? We have cloudy, we have hot, and we have mild uh, outlooks. This is what we call a nominal target, which is different from a numeric target, where we really want to predict a sort of price range or a numeric range. Now, given this condition, we can't say we got this many out of this many correct, right? So we can't use accuracy. Um, probably the thing that we would want to aim for is to say, well, we were this far off in terms of house prices. And this is what we call error. And with this, we immediately arrive at the types of prediction that there are. So when we want to predict certain classes, whether they are binary or more, this is what we call classification. And if we want to predict values, this is what we would call a regression. So before we use the uh, weather conditions as features, and it was sort of clear how they related to the target that we tried to predict. Now, now that we're using sort of the house prices as a target, it becomes sort of convoluted how the features sort of relate to the uh, to the actual price that we're trying to predict. If you thought of the features before, you might have said that, okay, location is a, is a pretty good indicator of uh, how high the price of a house should be. Now for location, for example, you might know that some certain neighborhood is actually a very good neighborhood and that would try drive the price of the houses up. That's pretty logical as a human. You might say, well, this is a good neighborhood and probably have to pay more for this house. They are probably also bigger houses and it's pretty clear how those relate. Now for pollution, it's already kind of messy. When is there enough pollution to really drive down the price? Uh, what is like a threshold for pollution that will be acceptable for actually selling the house? These kind of things require more expert knowledge. And it becomes even more difficult when these features interact, right? So say we have a good location, but it has high pollution. What would be the value of the house then? Would you sort of know? Do you have like a calculation to make? Uh, these things can become very convoluted uh, when you're sort of trying to figure it out uh, as being a human. Even more so, do you know, you know, do you not know enough about both of these to actually know how they interact? And uh, would you be able to sort of use their information to uh, craft a sort of rule set like we did before that would uh, very accurately try to predict this uh, this housing price. So as we're going through these slides, hopefully it's more evident that some problems are very hard to solve for humans. Uh, in these cases, handmade rules, as it says here, they're not flexible enough, so we can only interpret a part of the data. We can only uh, be we only have a certain limited set of creativity to create certain rules. And uh, especially given more data, uh, it will become very complex to, to construct more and more rules that will capture edge cases or to make them general enough. And that is, uh, in general, it's a lot of work. And even so, to the point where it becomes way too much to manually interpret all the data and construct these rules. So now we've really arrived to the point where data mining uh, sort of makes sense. We have a lot of data, we have sort of complex features that have some interaction, and um, most of them require real expert knowledge to sort of have a sense of how they affect a certain target. Now when we actually learn to predict, so we learn to sort of have an algorithm that automatically produces these rules, we don't really need this much expert knowledge. Only what we need is data, and if we have enough data, um, as you will see, it will become more and more possible to construct these kind of rules automatically. Now, on top of that, these kind of models that induce these, um, maybe their rule sets or their sort of different uh, models that interpret these features um, can also provide some information regarding these patterns or these features and how important they are and what kind of role they play uh, when predicting the target. So for example, if many rules mention location as a sort of first feature to look at, that is the most important one for predicting housing prices. Uh, it has a lot of weight or it, it's like the first rule in the whole chain of rules. Then we might say, okay, this is actually a pretty important feature 
uh, giving all the evidence that we have for predicting a, a certain house price. And this is sort of the core of machine learning where given enough features, we can hopefully successfully uh, predict a certain target with uh, very high accuracy. Now, previously when machine learning wasn't really that popular, uh, it was actually a very daunting task to, to sort of construct these kind of algorithms. Uh, you would need a lot of sort of mathematical knowledge or at least some very specific domain knowledge to tackle certain problems. Uh, as is very well uh, illustrated by this uh, XKCD comic right here. But since uh, that this comic was drawn, we've already uh, progressed a lot with machine learning uh, to whereas it's actually pretty, uh, you know, it's doable to, to predict if a photo has a bird like it's uh, postulated right here. And that brings us to the following, which is the current rise of uh, deep learning um, sort of what drives state-of-the-art machine learning right now. If you look for, for example, DeepMind, which is one of Google's uh, spin-off companies and AI and what they learn, you can see that they learn to play games. Um, they learn to intelligently uh, classify objects. They can play soccer, Starcraft, Atari games, and it can even learn based on its past experiences. So one might conclude that everything is solved. However, uh, definitely for data mining and also for machine learning, this is not the case. Um, if you want to be able to accurately tackle a problem, you need good intuitions regarding your data, you need domain expertise, and the very most important thing, you need to get to know your data. So it's not all just magic, we run a bunch of algorithms and we're done. So it's more like this comic here sort of illustrates where the problems that were hard for machine learning are still definitely very hard. So hopefully I've been able to give you a little glimpse into what uh, data science is sort of about and uh, what sort of the fundamentals are, interpreting data, making predictions and being uh, very careful when constructing these kind of uh, algorithms or methods to tackle these kind of problems. And we will cover a lot of cases, specific use cases of, of uh, very interesting problems throughout the course and show you how to sort of develop these kind of intuitions and have like a good feel to get started with uh, any data set basically. So if you have any specific questions regarding either the video lecture or the actual lecture, um, I would recommend you post them on forum and we will try to answer them as quickly as possible for you. Now, this does not really conclude the uh, video lecture yet. I have a very small bit, which is on uh, hardware specifically. Now, if you're already sort of comfortable with PC hardware and uh, maybe programming languages, these kind of things, you can go ahead and skip this. This is really for, for those of you who've never really seen a PC from the inside, who kind of don't know what the components are. And uh, this part will really really quickly run you through all these kind of things. So feel free to skip this if uh, this is already within your set of knowledge. Okay, so you might ask yourself, why do I need to know this? This is not a computer science class. Um, I, I'm not really interested in what the insides of a computer look like. Well, uh, the thing with data mining is that algorithm choices often depend on uh, hardware limitations. So what the, the systems that you're working with can specifically do, how large your data is, how complex it is, how many features you're using, all these kind of things. Now, some model families specifically deal with these kind of issues, so it's kind of hard to explain them if this is not kind of background knowledge for you. Now, most importantly, I'm going to assume that you know all this. So if I drop any terms during the uh, video lecture specifically, uh, you can always sort of come back to this one and uh, check what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's get started on PC hardware first. Now I have this nice uh, sort of PC image here. It shows the, uh, the inside of a desktop PC, basically. Now there's a bunch of components that uh, you don't really have to sort of deal with. There's this one right here, which is um, the power supply. And it's a pretty self-explanatory what it does. It, it drives the, the whole thing, basically. All the components get power through this guy right here. Um, the things that we will more specifically focus on is right here. That's the CPU or the processor. Um, here's the storage, the HDD or disks. That's where all your files are stored. 
and these things over here, which is RAM or memory. Now this whole thing right here is something we're also not dealing with. This is the motherboard. which connects all the components. Okay, so let's uh, sort of deal with them one by one. Then we'll walk slowly through what everything's doing and how it relates to uh, data and algorithms, basically. All right, so number one is the uh, hard drive, um, the place where all your files are stored. Commonly, they uh, look like this, uh, but you might know them better by this. This is when they open up. And more recently, we've moved to a sort of smaller um, enclosures. Um, they're solid state as well, so they don't have this sort of uh, uh, magnetic disk in there. And they don't have a writing arm, but that's not really important. What is important, however, is that uh, drives are used to store your files, obviously. So everything that you see in your file explorer or whatever, those files are basically all on your hard drive. Now the HDDs, they're sort of larger in size, so they range to from one to five terabytes somewhat. Now, if you don't really know what terabytes or gigabytes are, you're welcome to look that up. Um, in addition, they're slower in terms of reading and writing speed. So say that you copy something from one folder to the other, uh, this is something that will take longer on an HDD rather than an SSD. So the write speeds are slower. Now it's more fragile as well because it has this reading arm which can get damaged. Now SSDs, which are solid state drives, are smaller, so they range like up to about one terabyte. Um, but they are way faster, they're more robust, so if you drop them they don't really break, but they're very much more expensive than, than HDDs currently. Uh, most modern laptops actually come with this SSD because for obvious reasons, if you drop your laptop, your hard disk doesn't immediately uh, shatter. So for computation, uh, algorithms and models read data that is from your disk into what is called memory to actually do computations. And that's what we'll get to right here. So this is a memory chip or a card or a slot or how you want to call it. Uh, it's a piece of RAM basically. They look like this. Now what these do is that they are directly mounted on the motherboard, so they have a way faster interface for reading and writing than your HDDs uh, do. So they're way, way faster, even faster than SSDs in uh, reading and writing operations. But they're also very limited in space, so your typical machine might have like 8 to 16 gigs, uh, while servers might have up to 256 gigs somewhat. Um, and for the amount of gigs that you get, they're actually very, very expensive. Now, these kind of algorithms that we use can very quickly access and manipulate objects or, or data that are on this memory. Um, that is why generally all computation is done on data that is on this sort of memory slot. Now, if you load very large data sets, your memory basically exceeds, so the memory limit. Um, which generally causes either the program to throw an error if you're on Windows or whatever, but it might also freeze or, or slow down, these kind of things. Uh, this, this is caused by the fact that it can't really access this fast uh, objects anymore in memory and has to do like swap it to disk. Now, computation that is done on this in-memory data is handled by what we call the CPU. CPUs generally look like this, so it's uh, this little chip over here. Um, but they're generally covered by big heat sinks because when you actually run things on the processor, it gets warm. This is also why, for example, your laptop gets hot when you run too much stuff. And this is sort of to uh, get the heat out of there. So what does the CPU do? Uh, the CPU, the processor, handles all the computation. So all the calculations, all the operations within your computer. Now, a processor might have multiple cores, as they are called, and they're basically sort of little workers where you can use them if you have more than one of them. So you either have like a dual core, a quad core, maybe you've seen these terms when selecting your laptop or whatever. And they use these cores to run a sort of the same kind of operations in parallel. So, for example, if you have data and you read them into batches, so say the first four instances or something, you want to do calculations on them, you send them to any of these cores to do sort of the same operation, but then simultaneously, which basically speeds up the process. 
So the more expensive the CPU, the faster it does similar computations. So if you pay more money, basically it calculates faster. And in addition, the more cores it has, the uh, faster it will actually uh, run several parallel processes. So if you have eight cores, that will solve a kind of job that can be run in parallel faster than if you would have four. And then finally, we go to the GPU. Now the GPU is sort of a, a special CPU or kind of a special computation unit where uh, some jobs can actually be off shipped to a, a GPU rather than the CPU. Now this is commonly done for sort of video or image processing and it's very popular for uh, playing video games. You need one to really uh, play uh, graphically heavy uh, processes. Now for ordinary systems, usually GPU is kind of embedded in the CPU chip, so you don't really see this big card. Uh, same goes for your laptop, they have to be compact, so they're sort of embedded. Now GPUs are very fast at what's called matrix operations, which we will get into a bit later, but it's basically the reason why they've become very popular for doing uh, sort of deep learning research, which uh, involves a lot of matrix operations, basically. Now, this will all be explained in future lectures, so you don't really have to bother about it now. Uh, what is good to know is that it has its own RAM, so it has its own limitations, even smaller than what's usually in your system. Okay, so that concludes the hardware part. Now, for the programming part, I'm going to uh, keep it somewhat shorter because, uh, you know, I can talk a long time about this, but the only thing you really need to know is that there's many programming languages. Um, they all sort of vary in complexity, learning curve, um, and uh, they differ in how people refer to them as either low-level or high-level programming languages. Now, the language that we are going to use in this course, or more specifically, the packages that we're going to use are for Python. Now, Python is a scripting language that was actually built by a Dutch guy. Um, and one of the sort of advantages of Python is that it really, you know, it's a very high level language, so it almost reads like English. I can say that now if you really go into scripting and stuff, you will probably say, well, it's not really English, is it? It's actually pretty complicated. This is true, but if you sort of read the code or it kind of reads like pseudo code. So kind of the if statements are pretty clear if people code their variables and all kind of these things pretty in sort of plain English, you can sort of read the code. So Python, therefore, is a pretty high level language in that it doesn't really concern too much with uh, hardware operations. Now, this is different than, for example, uh, C++, which is right here, or C, which is even more low level. And I thought I saw Prolog here. That's even more low level. So the more low level a programming language is, the less it sort of reads very comfortably, the more it really deals with, with hardware. And um, you know, it's more complicated, basically. Now, the higher level ones are definitely uh, Java or C Sharp might also be considered somewhat high level. Uh, Perl, and then here we have Python. And other things deal with more uh, web development kind of environments. Uh, so Ruby is here. Uh, even JavaScript is here. These are all very high level languages. So there's not too much between the hardware and the actual operations. Most of that is actually off ship to lower level languages like C or Prolog. So Python, for example, has a C backend. This is all not very important, but it's sort of good to know what the relation between these uh, kind of things are. So most important thing to note is that we're using Python. It's a high level language and therefore it's uh, more usable. Uh, same thing for R, which you might use if you uh, stick in the master. Uh, R is a language that specifically deals with statistics. So it's even more specialized than Python. Uh, and therefore it can also be regarded as a bit more convenient to use. All right, so that concludes the uh, video lectures and I will uh, see you in the practical video.